Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. We appreciate you checking it out. This is our Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time weekly video. We hope everyone is doing well. Interesting topic today, one that we came across, uh, felt like was valuable for us, which means also hopefully it feels valuable for you all. And that is a video on erythritol. This is a common, you know, they call it a sugar alcohol found in many artificial sweeteners and actually other foods as well. And a study came out, a pretty well done study, that showed a significant increased potential risk in cardiovascular outcomes, things like heart attacks and strokes, uh, in those consuming uh, or having high levels of erythritol in their blood. And we're, we're going to dive into that today. Before we do that, though, um, quick matter of business. For those not interested in listening to this, we put in the description like the timestamp, so feel free to skip ahead. But we're going to spend a minute or two doing a shout out to our newest Whiteboard Doctor education uh, platform, which is our email newsletter. Hundreds of you have signed up for it. We're so appreciative. Um, so we have a new Whiteboard Doctor newsletter. It comes out on the 1st and 15th through email of each month. And we really want to encourage you all to sign up. The sign up link is in the video description as well as in the pinned comment. And if you're curious what it looks like, this is just our most recent video from last week. And this is the uh, video description here. And we have join our whiteboard doctor newsletter. Um, and if you click the link, what will happen is this will pop up and you just put in your email, sign up, and that's that. You are entered into um, our email group that it will then send the newsletter to. We did just want to let you know, some of you reached out to us after our uh, first inaugural uh, email newsletter last week saying that you actually found it in your junk and spam folder. So if you did not get that email, definitely go to your junk or spam and make sure to add us so that we uh, no longer go to the junk or spam. And then anyone who's signing up now, uh, definitely make sure you keep an eye out on your junk and spam on the 1st and 15th of each month to make sure the email newsletter does not go to your junk or spam. If anyone wants a little glimpse into what this might look like, so this is our inaugural one and it's gonna be a moving target. We want to hear your feedback in terms of what's working, what's not working. Is it too long, too short, you want different stuff in it, so shoot us an email at drwhiteboard at gmail.com, or you can actually just respond to the email newsletter email. But this was our one from May 1st. If you sign up now, we're going to send this one out again on May 8th for those late signups, so you'll have it. Um, but we started with just some quick hits, things like bird flu, XBB 1.6, Marburg virus. Then we talked about some COVID-19 news, a new potential treatment for long COVID fatigue. Uh, we talked about increased gastrointestinal problems at one year with COVID. Uh, we then went into global health, talking about Nipah virus, which is a recurring epidemic. It hasn't gone outside of this geographic area, but there is human to human transmission. Uh, we then talked about how blueberries uh, in elderly folks may actually increase cognitive function and some details on what that might look like. And then we also talked about a new study that came out that showed a lot of over-the-counter supplements, particularly in this study, melatonin, may not really have the ingredients and the doses that they advertise. And then last, learn a new disease. We talked about lupus uh, and all that good stuff. So if you're interested in this type of email newsletter, again, please sign up. We'd love to have a bunch of you on there. Uh, the bigger the group, the better for us. So think about that. That is our business today. Uh, we're going to do a quick 30 second break for our introduction and then we'll dive into the video. Hello everyone and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to provide you with free, interesting, relevant, understandable medical education and news for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. We have weekly videos that we debut Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with bonus medical education videos posted throughout the week. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Doctor community and follow along by hitting the subscribe button located in the bottom right-hand corner. We also encourage all likes and comments, even if it is just to say hello. All our video descriptions contain links for additional related videos that might be interesting, so don't forget to check those out. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. With no further ado, stay well, keep learning, and let's get to the video. All right, so erythritol. Those of you who have been very plugged into this type of thing probably saw news headlines from, they're still going on, but from a month to three months ago um, about this. What exactly is erythritol? Why is this important? Why are we talking about it? Well, erythritol is what we call a sugar 
alcohol. It's not really a sugar and not really an alcohol, but it has gained that name. And it is this molecule that is like a sugar, but we actually don't metabolize it in the same way we do a sugar like glucose. It's present naturally in small amounts in fruits and vegetables, and the small amounts is going to be important to keep in mind later on. And then our body actually also makes it in small amounts through something called the pentose phosphate pathway, which is an alternate pathway that makes energy for our cells to use. But again, small amounts. What's happened though, since we don't metabolize it, um, and it has a slightly sweet taste, it's in a lot of artificial sweeteners, um, sugar-free foods, keto foods, that type of thing. Um, this is from a website we came across, who let us mute our computer, apologies, that had a, a nicely laid out list of some of the common foods that has it. Um, so check it out, we'll link it in the video description. It's erythritol proves we should never get cute with food, one step foods, this was the author. And um, they essentially pointed out a couple of foods just as examples that have a large amount of erythritol, things like Truvia, Splendid, Vitamin Water Zero, Notice, right, these are artificial sweeteners. Vitamin water zero implying zero sugar, because this is a, you know, quote unquote, you know, artificial sugar. Um, Halo top ice cream, things like chewing gum, jelly, chocolate, hard candy, yogurt, diet flavored sodas and drinking waters, etc., etc. In addition to that, um, it is not necessarily reported on all nutritional fact panels. So because erythritol is not a sugar, and because the inclusion of, quote, sugar alcohols on nutritional fact panels is voluntary, you need to look in the ingredient list to determine if the food you are eating contains this substance. Seeing sugar alcohol in the ingredient list may be the only clue that erythritol is present in the food. So keep that in mind as well. It might just say sugar alcohol. It might not specifically say erythritol. But do note there are a number of different sugar alcohols. Erythritol is not the only one. When it comes to foods, this one is um, widely approved. So the World Health Organization, erythritol is approved for consumption and deemed safe. The U.S. Food and Drug, FDA, erythritol, uh, approved for consumption, deemed safe. European Food Safety Authority, also approved, although they kind of do some GI warnings. Some people get GI upset just because we don't necessarily uh, absorb it in the same way we do uh, sugar that is not a sugar alcohol. So that's what your erythritol is. What happened, though, is... A couple months ago, we started seeing all these different headlines. So we just Googled in Google News, erythritol, and all these different headlines started to pop up. So USA Today, sweetener erythritol may increase risk for stroke, blood clots, death. Uh, today, what is erythritol? Sugar substitute linked to heart attacks, strokes. Time, a study linked erythritol to heart attacks, should you worry. CBS News, erythritol, a zero calorie artificial sweetener. Uh, linked to heart attack, stroke, study find. So all these started to come out a couple months ago. Why did they? What was this based off of? Should we be worried? What does it mean? Should we be consuming this quote-unquote zero-calorie artificial sweetener, or should we not? Well, most of these headlines actually referred to this study here, published in Nature Medicine, the artificial sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk. So if we scroll down, we have... It zoomed in. We're going to link it in the video description. It's these authors' work, so we uh, commend them for that. The artificial sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk. Uh, it was actually received by the journal back in July, accepted at the end of January, and then published online at the end of February, and then it came out in print, we believe, in March. Uh, these are the authors here, so again, commend them. And what they essentially said in kind of their introductory statements were that erythritol and artificial sweeteners are often recommended for those at higher risk for CV, cardiovascular CV problems. Like patients with diabetes, for instance, patients with uh, coronary artery disease, previous heart attacks, often get obesity, often get recommended these artificial sweeteners because they're, you know, zero calorie, they're not glucose or sugar in the traditional sense. We don't metabolize them the same way we do sugar. And these populations are often the populations at highest risk 
for cardiovascular problems, diabetics, those with previous cardiovascular disease, obese patients, um, and a ton of people have been recommended these. If I'm being transparent, I think I have some in my cabinet right now, some of these artificial sweeteners. The thing, though, that these authors mention is that there haven't been a lot of great studies on the long-term effects of these artificial sweeteners, particularly erythritol and those who are consuming them. So there haven't been a lot of high-quality studies on the long-term effects. Now, they're widely approved, right? The World Health Organization, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., the European equivalent to that. Of the studies available, the uh, authors of the study we're talking about today kind of categorize some of them. There was mixed results. Some small studies actually in animal models show that endothelial function, which are the cells that line our blood vessels, might have some improvement when these animals were given erythritol. Other studies showed some possible antioxidant effects, which is really a vague term. Um, and then there's other studies that showed in young healthy volunteers who got erythritol uh, for a period of time, they had increased kind of central abdomen adiposity or fat. And another study, a small study, showed increased risk for diabetes. But all these were small studies. None of them were big, powerful, well-done studies. These authors went on to say a little descriptor about erythritol, which we thought might be valuable to include here. This is a quote from their study, so it's obviously their work. We'll link this study in the video description, as we always do. And they say erythritol is a four-carbon sugar alcohol commonly used as a sugar substitute. It's naturally present in low amounts, remember, low amounts in fruits and vegetables. But when it's incorporated into processed foods, it's typically added at levels 1,000-fold higher than endogenous levels. And endogenous levels, remember, we in our cells through the pentose phosphate pathway, PPP, make low levels of erythritol. But the ones in processed foods, the levels in processed foods are often much, much higher than we get either in fruits, vegetables, or than our cells make. Um, they mention that the reason for this is that it's got a little bit of a lower sweetness as compared to sucrose. Uh, so it ends up in higher amounts in these uh, artificial, not artificial, processed foods. The daily intake of erythritol in the U.S. population is estimated to reach up to 30 grams per day. 30 grams per day in some participants. Now, some's a vague term, so take that with a grain of salt. Based on the 2013-2014 National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys and FDA filings. So, summary statement here is we all in our bodies have these small levels, basal levels of erythritol, even if we're not consuming processed foods or artificial sweeteners. Our cells make it. We need it for the pentose phosphate pathway. It's in small amounts in fruits and vegetables. But these authors are really zeroing in on that at higher doses, the doses you get in processed foods and artificial sweeteners, that could be concerning. And with that being said, many of us seem to be consuming large amounts of erythritol based on the survey. And this is kind of redundant. We already mentioned that. We don't metabolize erythritol like we do other sugars. So it's a zero, quote unquote, zero calorie kind of sugar substitute, which is why we see it in all these artificial sweeteners or keto diets, et cetera, et cetera. So what these authors did is they looked at hundreds of patients. They, they did a few things. The first thing they did was look at hundreds of patients in the USA and in Europe. And we're going to focus on the left here write these graphs to start. And I'm going to explain them. I know they look busy and that's okay, but we're going to talk about what all this means. So we have this one was in the USA. The graph below was in Europe. And you can see here number of patients. All right. They have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. The Qs in this stand for quartile. And the quartile they're referring to is the amount of erythritol in the body. So what these authors did is they um, essentially went to a cardiovascular clinic and patients who are just coming there, randomly coming there or referred there for workup of cardiovascular disease, they talked to those patients and essentially got consent to draw their blood. And what they did when they drew their blood is they did, oh, we'll see if we can remember how to spell it, Metabolonomics is what they call it. Um, Metabola being metabolism, and then onyx being they looked at just 
a ton of different molecules in these patients' bloods, particularly molecules like erythritol. And then they tried to figure out if any of these molecules were correlated with bad outcomes at three years. And erythritol was the culprit one that they found. So what these graphs show is three-year event-free survival. And the event they were looking at was MACE. MACE stands for Major Adverse Cardiac Events, aka things like heart attacks and strokes. And the quartiles are the amount of erythritol in the blood samples for each person. So quartile 1 was less than 3.75 micromoles of erythritol. Quartile 2 was this, quartile 3, quartile 4. So as the quartiles went up, the amount of erythritol in the blood samples per patient were increased. And that was drawn in patients who were fasting overnight. So they didn't eat anything, then they went to this cardiovascular clinic. The researcher said, hey, do you want to be enrolled in this study where we test your blood for these compounds? People who said yes, they said great, took a blood sample, tested it for a lot of things erythritol included. The amount of erythritol in the blood they then stratified the patient, aka was it less than 3.75, you know, 3.75 to 4.6, 4.6 to 5.9, or greater than 5.9. And then they followed these patients for three years. And they looked to see, based on the amount of erythritol in those patients' blood during that initial visit, three years from now, who had major adverse cardiac events? And very staggeringly, they saw that by year three, Quartile 4, those with the highest amounts of erythritol, had a significant number of uh, significant higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. So three-year event-free survival, meaning if you were 100, 100% all of the patients, if a line was here, had no heart attack or stroke. 80% means that um, 80% had no heart attack or stroke, aka 20% did. So in this quartile four, it means of patients with erythritol levels at that clinic appointment that were above 5.9, 20% of those patients had a heart attack or stroke as compared to what's probably about 95% uh, did not, aka 5% did have a heart attack or stroke in quartile four. So this might sound confusing, but if I draw it out, quartile one, about 5% had a heart attack or stroke at three years. Quartile two, let's see, we'll say probably about 7% had a heart attack or stroke at three years. Quartile three, maybe about 9% had a heart attack or stroke. And then quartile four at three years, about 20% had a heart attack or stroke. So as the amount of erythritol in these blood samples increased, the likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke at three years increased. And they did the same thing in patients in Europe. And what they found was almost the exact same thing, but even more staggering. So you can see down here, this is the European cohort. Same thing, quartile one, two, three, four. So this was the lowest levels of erythritol compared to the highest levels of erythritol. And if we look, three-year event-free survival for quartile four went down to almost 55%. So in the European cohort, those with the highest amount of erythritol, almost 45% of them had a heart attack or stroke at three years. And that's a huge number compared to about 90% uh, did not, aka 10% did have a heart attack or stroke in quartile one. So it was 10% compared to 45%. Quartile 1, the lowest amount of erythritol, compared to quartile 4, the highest amount of erythritol. Now, do keep in mind, they only tested the erythritol just one time during this initial appointment. And they're, you know, it's how they designed the study, but there's no way to say throughout the three years if that erythritol level stayed high. But the assumption was, and it's an assumption, so there's potential for error here, the assumption was that those with high erythritol levels probably continue to eat the same amount of things in the same way, aka the same amount of erythritol as they were doing initially. But again, just something to point out with this study. They then went on to, I'm going to come back to this uh, graph here, but they then went on to say, okay, well, let's look at the smaller groups, aka 
uh, within the United States and Europe, let's kind of divide those patients up into those older and younger, female, male, high blood pressure, diabetes, because what we don't want is for, you know, we want to know if this effect is just in men or just in the elderly or just in those with diabetes. Maybe there's a certain risk factor that is causing this increased cardiovascular risk in those taking erythritol. And the graph here essentially is what we call a hazard ratio. So anything to the right means there's an increased HR, an increased hazard ratio. And a way you can think about that is, you know, if it was about here, it's about a four time increase risk of having a major adverse cardiac event, a MACE. If it was to the left, it'd be a lower risk. If anything crosses this one line, it means that there's no risk or benefit. It's just neutral because it's one time the number, which is still the same number. And what they found was in all these kind of subgroups, there was still a higher risk of major adverse cardiac events, right? They're all to the right of one. So elderly and younger, female and male, high blood pressure or normal blood pressure. Now, diabetes does cross this line a little bit. So technically, this is not statistically significant, but it sure almost is. Um, A1C, which is a measure of diabetes, uh, GFR, which is a measure of kidney function, BMI, so obese and not obese, coronary artery disease, again, almost crosses one there, but still pretty much higher, history of heart attack, uh, high cholesterol, good cholesterol, triglycerides in the U.S. cohort, and same thing in the European cohort, right? To the right means increased hazard ratio, uh, and all these are also to the right in the European cohort. And the number here would suggest, you know, 3.49 times higher risk of a major adverse cardiac event in this population, uh, which is quite interesting again. So then the author said, okay, well, this is an observational trial. We're looking back in time. There's risk for things like confounding variables, things that are hard to control for when you're just looking back in time. It's not a randomized trial. So what could this be from? We need a kind of physiologic reason that would explain this. What does erythritol do that might increase people's risk of heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events in those consuming more of it? And they did a couple things. The first thing they did was graph down here. And this is a really busy graph. Uh, we at Whiteboard Doctor, we're not benchtop scientists. We can't even begin to dive into the details of this. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. But the summary statement here is they essentially got human cells, things like human platelets, and then they bathed them in erythritol and found that when that happened, through a number of endpoints, there was an increased risk of clotting, right? So aggregation increased 1.97 times with erythritol. Um, with higher doses of erythritol, increased platelet aggregation. Um, same thing over here. This was an ADP assay, a trap assay. We're not even entirely sure what those are, but nonetheless, increased platelet aggregation. When they bathed it in different kind of clotting material, um, again, with the actual erythritol, increased aggregation, increased uh, P-selectin, um, increased... 2B3A activation, all these are kind of markers of blood clotting. So they said, well, now we have a physiologic potential explanation for why erythritol increases cardiovascular outcomes, because it seems when we look at it in the lab that we get increased platelet aggregation, platelet are blood clotting cells, um, which could increase the risk for things like thrombosis and blood clots, which at the end of the day, a heart attack is a clot in one of the blood vessels that feeds blood to the heart, a stroke is a clot in one of the blood vessels that feeds blood to the brain. So not only did they show in this large population study an increased risk of blood clotting in the heart or brain, but then they also proved a possible mechanism, a possible reason for why the erythritol might increase the risk of these things. But then they said, well, let's pause for a minute. We only tested the blood of these people one time. Uh, we don't necessarily know even how much erythritol is absorbed, how much you need to eat to get to these higher levels. So what they did was they took a handful of healthy volunteers, that's in this graph here, a handful of healthy volunteers who agreed to be part of the study, and they essentially gave them a one-time 
a dose of 30 grams of erythritol. So effects of an erythritol challenge on mean plasma levels. They gave them this erythritol drink and then they mapped the erythritol levels in their blood up to a week after just consuming this drink one time. So they consumed the 30 gram erythritol drink at zero minutes and then they tested their blood for erythritol levels up until seven days. N equals eight is the number of healthy volunteers. This is eight people that agreed to do this. Now, one may say 30 grams of erythritol in a drink is a lot, but the authors went on to say that there's actually a number of these kind of zero sugar drinks that have 30 grams of erythritol. There's also a handful of ice cream pints that have 30 grams of erythritol. So the authors argue this is not that much more than some people consume in one sitting. And if we go up, remember the author said that based on this health and nutrition examination survey from 2013, 2014, many people consume up to 30 grams of erythritol per day. So although some criticize the study saying 30 grams is a lot, the authors have some rationale here for why they chose 30 grams. Interestingly though, what they found, and this is the concentration of erythritol in micromolars, is that the concentration stayed somewhat elevated for days, right? So 30 minutes, a huge spike up to 10,000 micromoles in pretty much all the patients by kind of 30 minutes slowly came down six hours, one day, two days, still elevated. And then up by seven days, it came back down to this kind of 4.5 micromoles of erythritol concentration. If we compare this to the micromoles in their quartiles that they studied, the quartile one was less than 3.6 grams of erythritol. Quartile four was greater than 6.3, similar for the U.S., um, so up to 10,000 in this day and then stayed above, you know, quartile one for multiple days until it came back down to kind of less than 4.5, which was the lowest part uh, micromoles that they actually uh, actually studied. And they put this little graph here, which is handy, because this is from the experiments that they did in the lab looking at erythritol and blood clotting. And they found that there was increased thrombin, a molecule that does blood clotting, at 45 micromoles of erythritol. Increased aggregation of platelets at 18 micromoles. P-selectin, another kind of blood clotting molecule at 18 micromoles. And then 2B3A activation at 4.5 micromoles. So at all of these doses above this 4.5, not only in the lab experiments did they show there is all these mechanisms for increased blood clotting, but in their patient experiments, they showed that as the micromoles went up to the highest quartile, there was a much higher increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular events in that group who had higher amounts of erythritol in their blood. So really impressive study, very large study. Um, we like the fact that not only did they do this big population study looking at people and major adverse cardiac events, but they then said, hey, wait, let's try to figure out why erythritol might do this. And they found a reason why it might do that. And then they went back and said, okay, well, let's even see how long erythritol lasts in the blood and to what doses. Are those doses that it lasts in the blood similar to doses that we saw in the actual clinical experiments when we tests, tested the amount of erythritol in the blood for people, and they found out, yeah, it is. Now, people have looked at this uh, trial, and it is an observational trial. It means there's correlation here. There's not causation. You can't say for certain from this trial that erythritol itself is the reason for the increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. And one of the big criticisms of the study, and the, the trial authors actually totally acknowledge this when they talk about the trial shortcomings, critics have pointed out that it's an observational trial. People were not randomized, right? Because that's, you can't randomize people for three years to consume erythritol and to not. Number one, that probably would be unethical, especially in light of these studies. Number two, to randomize thousands of people and then make them take erythritol every day for years and then to have another group who's just doing placebo, that would be incredibly difficult to do. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to sign up for that experiment to, you know, take erythritol every day for three years. Um, so that's not a study that really can be done in a meaningful way, at least not in a way that we can think about. But this was a large observational trial, which is next best thing, although best is a relative term. 
But as an observational trial, it could have missed confounding variables. And one of the big ones that people who have criticized this study and the result of the study talk about is that it didn't control for diet. So let's hypothetically say, so you're comparing people, here are some people who you tested their blood for higher levels of erythritol. And let's say that this group is the three arrows high of erythritol. This group is the one arrow high of erythritol. And we saw this group had much higher risk of major adverse cardiac events, whereas this group had mildly high, but not nearly as high. And we're saying, well, this group had much more erythritol than this group, so obviously it's the erythritol that's causing the increase in major adverse cardiac events. But what if also these patients who have high erythritol levels happen to be consuming, we're just going to make up a name, much more, I don't know, choose whatever you want, a uh, random name, this isn't the right time to waste time thinking of a name. So we'll just call it much more glug, because glug has more erythritol in it. And that is the reason that there's higher erythritol in their blood. But glug also has chemical A in it. So although we didn't study that, this group also has much higher levels of chemical A. And, and maybe it's actually not the erythritol, but it's chemical A causing the higher risk of major adverse cardiac events, meaning it's not necessarily the erythritol, but it's chemical A in the glug. There's no way to know to differentiate this because it's just correlation, it's not causation. Alternatively, it could be literally as easy as you know, maybe the people who are consuming more artificial sweeteners also like to eat more donuts. And the donuts are the cause of the increased major adverse cardiac events. Stupid example, but they didn't control for that. We don't know. Maybe the diet varied. The, the diet did vary significantly because the diet is how they got their high erythritol levels. But was there more in that diet variability than just the erythritol to explain this? And it's a good criticism. It's a fair criticism. There's no way to know for sure. Um, which is why, you know, as we always say, we're not recommending to consume or to not consume or to cut down or any of that on erythritol. Talk to your doctor about it. This is just opinion talking about a trial. It's not medical recommendation. Um, but that is one of the criticisms and shortcomings of the study, which the authors totally acknowledge and, and agree with, is that this is just correlation. There seems to be a correlation in higher erythritol levels and major adverse cardiac events, although you can't say for sure it's a causation. Although these authors um, sure as heck did a great job in uh, studying this in multiple different ways with consistent results and a possible physiologic reason for why you might have increased uh, blood clotting causing strokes or heart attacks in this group. So we're, for our own personal self, not our medical opinion, probably going to take this into account, but obviously digest the information, talk to your doctors, and uh, make a decision with your doctor uh, on how you how you guys feel about this. Hopefully it was interesting, helpful, informative, something like that. Uh, definitely check out our newsletter. We'd love for you all to sign up. Check your spam or junk if you miss it the first time. And if you sign up now on the 8th, we're going to send out that May 1st newsletter again. So you can read that again. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Happy Friday. Stay well. Keep learning. And we will see you all next time.